It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. What is the meaning of religious liberty, its role in a free and democratic society, and concerns regarding trends in Canada? Now today I have with me quite a remarkable panel who I'll be pleased to introduce in just a moment. You know, Canada is considered to be a free and democratic society, and we hope that it will remain such a society that recognizes all individuals as created equal, and that our children will inherit a society in which exists that spirit of liberty. Now, some of the most fundamental questions for human beings are, who are we and why are we here and what is our purpose? Now, these questions have existed throughout history and are just as pressing today as they were in ages past. Now, as Christians, an important and fundamental value to the Christian worldview is the recognition of the divine right of independent thought, belief, and expression. Now, Jesus Christ himself recognized this, and he declared the right of every individual to dissent, even from his own very words and religion. Jesus himself said in John 12, verse 47, If any man hears my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Today, to help us understand this subject in more depth, I have a wonderful panel of experts. Gentlemen, welcome to It Is Written Canada. Now, just to my left is Kevin Boonstra. Kevin is a lawyer. He works and is a partner with Kuhn LLP and practices there in Vancouver and in the Fraser Valley. Kevin practices in both litigation and commercial, along with charity matters for broad spectrum of businesses and nonprofit clients. He has published articles in a variety of trade and academic and general media publications in the area of constitutional and human rights law and religious freedom issues. He's lectured on a broad array of topics across Canada and has given seminars for many groups, including the Continuing Legal Education Society of British Columbia and has been a commentator in both print and television media. Kevin represents and guides clients through legal and practical problems both inside and outside the courts. He's acted as counsel on a number of high profile cases and has appeared in all levels of court in British Columbia and has represented clients to the Supreme Court of Canada in constitutional cases. Kevin's married, has two children. Kevin, I wanna welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure, Chris. Well, and just to your right is Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson, I've known the longest of all of our guests. Mark Johnson is a pastor and currently serves as president of the church, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. He has a vast experience as a pastor and administrator in Canada, the U.S., and in mission fields abroad. He is appreciated for his openness and availability to church members and his ability to listen. He has a strong vision for the future for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. Pastor Johnson, we are so happy to have you here today as a part of this panel. Delighted to be here, Chris. And then to your right, we have Gerald Chipier. Uh, Gerald also is a lawyer. Gerald has over the years focused primarily on public policy. Private sector and public sector clients have relied on him to navigate the rules that regulate the way business and government achieve their objectives. Now, Jerry has argued cases before every level of court in Canada, including 20 matters before the Supreme Court of Canada. Most of those matters have focused on the Constitution and human rights. He has written over 100 legal articles on topics such as administrative law, charitable organizations, the Constitution, education, ethics, and government integrity, along with First Nations, health care, and human rights. He serves on the board of directors of a number of different charities that have a focus on health and human services. Jerry, we welcome you to the program and so happy to have you as a part of this panel. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So, gentlemen, we're going to have a discussion, and we are beginning this discussion on the whole issue of 
of, of human rights in the context of religious freedom. And so I'm going to begin with you, Mark, and ask you this question. Can you share with us some insights on what the Bible has to say about freedom of thought, freedom of religion? Those are important questions, really, when you think about it, Chris, uh, because um, as people of faith, we view things from the frame of reference of Scripture, for instance. And as a Christian uh, believer, as a person who has a Christian faith basis, I go back in Old Testament times and I read what it says there when it says, um, choose you this day who you will serve, book of uh, Joshua 24th chapter. So religious freedom is about choice. It's about not being coerced by other people's decisions, but making an active decision that you are going to live a life of faith based upon your determination. In history, I think frequently we have had people who have tried to make decisions for other individuals. The faith-based decision is an individual decision, and that's what the scripture affirms. And you know, uh, Mark, if I can follow that up, because sometimes there is a view, a very a public view of, of religion, and in particular Christianity, as being very narrow-minded and not mm -hmm. open to this idea of freedom of thought, freedom of religion. If we can probe that a little more deeply, are you saying that the God of the Bible, and in particular the God of the Old Testament, allows for this freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of religion? Sure, and, and I think that the issue, Chris, is that God wants people who actively choose to put Him in their life because if he had another view, he could have determined that we would not have that option. Uh, we would be reduced to a different level of reality. But one of the things about being a human being in the creation of God is, is that he gave us the opportunity to choose. And with that comes the opportunity to say, I'm going to walk away from that. Obviously that would not be God's first choice, but if that's my first choice, God honors that. Kevin, do you have any thoughts on this, uh, this idea of freedom yeah, of religion? I, I, I completely agree with everything Mark's saying. Uh, I often say that the Garden of Eden is really the first religious liberty story that exists in the Bible. It was God saying, I, I give you a choice. You can choose to follow me or you can choose something else. And it's always struck me that if God has, is prepared to give us as humans that choice, we have to be prepared to give one another that choice as well. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, have, uh, I often will ask the question uh, when I'm speaking to groups, is there anything that God cannot do? Uh, and, I, and I tell them in advance, that's a trick question because the reality is there is something that God cannot do or rather probably better put, He chooses not to do. And that choice is He chooses not to force our will and give us that freedom of thought. Uh, I love that uh, the, the Garden of Eden, the very foundation of this earth, is actually the foundation of religious liberty. Jerry, any thoughts uh, on that? Well, these days with uh, the reputation that government has, I think Jesus was uh, right to remind us to keep Caesar and the church separate, render unto God the things that are God's and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Uh, with the arguments these, day, these days that we have about the deep state and about uh, red tape and bureaucracies, very wise. And I think uh, it, uh, it's something that we should remember. That is one of the uh, cornerstones of freedom of religion, keeping government away from the church and the church away from government. They just don't mix. Well, and that's interesting. I've just recently had uh, the opportunity to tour a good portion of Europe and we can see throughout history that when that happens, when government and religion mix, uh, that is always bad news and it is especially bad news for the minority who do not hold to the beliefs of the majority. So gentlemen, we want to probe this a little more deeply. We, we, we could spend a lot of time uh, and, and I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to resist the temptation to have a grand theological discussion on the basis of, gov uh, of the government of God and, uh, and its basis on this freedom. But we see clearly throughout the scriptures that you, you quoted some words of Jesus, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Uh, you quoted words of the Old Testament. We actually see throughout the Bible that there is this freedom of thought. God allows people to choose whether they want to be a part of the government that he is setting up sometime in the future, and that's a whole different subject, 
or whether they choose to go whatever path they want to go. And so, Kevin, I want to direct a question towards you, and, and, and Jerry was alluding to it, but what is the role that religious freedom, religious liberty, plays in the foundation of a free and democratic society? Um, before I get there, yes, uh, sure, I, please. I, I really want to comment on what you just talked about okay. with a path, because yeah. in Matthew 7, we see Jesus talking about narrow is the path, that, that leads to salvation. And immediately what follows from that is talking about false prophets. So I've always read that scripture as well as being a, a question of choice. Jesus saying, look, you can choose this path, but again, you're not mandated to do that. If the imperative of the scriptures is love, um, there is no love without granting choice, it seems to me. Um, and so uh, if that's what we're called to do is to love one another, part of that love must be granting each other the right to um, choose the truth or choose error. Um, with, without that, there can be, in my view, no Christian love. Uh, and, 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 and getting back to your question, yes. uh, I think that's the same as we would view the foundations of a civil society, right? That there has to be, um, both there has to be order, there clearly has to be order, but within that order, there has to be a carved out space for people to follow their conscience, to follow God the best way that they know how, or to choose to follow something else, uh, whether it's uh, atheism or agnosticism or some other religion. Uh, without that choice, uh, the government is no longer carving out a space and treating everybody equally, but rather mandating, uh, mandating either secularism or, or, or even worse, mandating a belief that there is no God or requiring that, that uh, you conduct yourself as though you don't have fundamental uh, Christian or other religious beliefs. Uh, and when, when the government does that, it actually removes that choice that we say is, is given to us in the Bible. Well, and I, I want to comment on your, you know, Matthew 7, and I, and I, that is a beautiful analogy that you've laid before us. Again, it's this whole idea of choice. It reflects back on the comment that you made earlier, uh, Pastor Johnson, and that is, choose you this day. Jesus lays out a choice. And so the very foundation, and then you talked about order. God has an order, and that order in the Judeo-Christian tradition is that order that he sets forth as the Ten Commandments. This is what a society looks like and keeps order and keeps things healthy. However, he also gives the freedom to choose uh, within the context of keeping, uh, and it would be the same way in society, there are laws of the land which keep order, but then there needs to be, and I like that word, this carved out piece that gives freedom of thought and expression, and especially that freedom of religion. Now, Jerry, you, you kind of brought us down this path of, of, of government and, and, uh, and religion mixing. Do you have any comments on this, this, this essential foundation for a free society when we talk about religious liberty? Well, one of the principles that I think we have in some countries of the world forgotten is that God doesn't need the puny help of humans in protecting his name. And unfortunately, a number of countries have decided that they would use this concept of blasphemy to defend God. And uh, unfortunately, a number of public officials and others in uh, countries around the world are facing not just the loss of a job, not just uh, imprisonment, but even death because of a desire on the part of some individual to defend God's name. He doesn't need our defense, and any defense we can provide, in fact, is going to backfire in terms of society and create less of a society, not a greater society. And when you talk about that defense, I want to probe that just a little bit further. When you talk about that defense, when we as individuals think like we need to defend that, are you implying then that we need to be very cautious about the implementation uh, or the legislation of morality as it relates to a particular religion. Is that what you're getting at with uh, what you're making comments on? Well, absolutely. Coercion is, is always uh, the opposite of God's love. God's love is the opposite of coercion as we, we uh, have discussed so far. And, and blasphemy laws around the world today are being used as an attempt to coerce individuals to both say and to believe a certain set of beliefs against whatever they might, in fact, choose to believe. And I think that's where society starts down a road that just simply doesn't make any sense. And I've asked this question, and maybe we can uh, dwell on this. And, and Pastor Johnson, I want to get your thoughts. I don't want to get too far from here, but I want to ask a question that I've often asked when people start talking to me about the uh, passing of laws, the legislation of morality. 
I ask the fundamental question, whose morality will we implement? Will we pass laws that implement the, uh, the morality of Seventh-day Adventists? Will we pass laws that implement the morality of the Roman Catholic Church, of the Anglican Church, maybe the United Church, maybe Hinduism, maybe Islam, maybe Buddhism? We must ask that question. So what you're getting at, because if we implement any of those, what is, I mean, what's the logical conclusion, Kevin, if we implement laws of a particular belief system? What happens? Yeah, and this is, this is uh, one of the main struggles that we see uh, when it comes to this carving out of a space that I've talked about. Um, because there does have to be order. Uh, and there does have to be some common sense within a society of what's moral and not moral. We have a criminal code. There are large parts of the criminal code are based in uh, common consensus on what's moral behavior and what's not moral behavior. Um, and, and when society no longer shares the, the, a, a view about moral and immoral behavior, we see a breakdown. People no, no longer will obey the criminal code. And we've seen that in our society with certain criminal laws over the past where the vast majority of the society no longer believes that certain behavior should be immoral. So where do you get? You know, where, where do uh, morals come from in a secular society? And that is a major struggle because uh, religious people, Christians and others, ground their uh, views of morality within their religious beliefs, and they're absolutely entitled to do that. But in a broader, more secular society, which honors and respects all religious groups, there does have to be some commonality, some consensus around which morals we're going to legislate around and which we aren't. But when we do that, when we as a society start legislating around ideas of morality, we have to be very cautious and very sensitive not to be co coercing people against their conscience, as Jerry was talking about. Pastor Johnson, what, uh, what do you have uh, as in the way of thoughts on this foundation of a society on uh, religious li liberty, freedom of thought, and in the general conversation we've uh, continued to have here? Well, it seems to me that uh, first and foremost, if faith-based uh, life is a choice, uh, we have to give people the opportunity to make that choice, even if they make a choice that does not agree with the majority of individuals who are out there. And that becomes a very lonely discussion uh, for a lot of individuals. If, if everybody on your block has a faith basis, and you choose to be the odd person out, obviously you have to have a fairly strong level of conviction in order to sustain that for any period of time. And I admire people who have those kinds of convictions because I think that it is very easy in the world in which we live simply to mirror the average faith basis or the average concept of what life is all about and what is good and what is not so good that is mirrored by the person on the street challenge with that is, is that does not imply much mental processing on the part of the individual. And if, if we are going to understand why we are who we are, why we make the choices that we make, uh, those usually come about as a little higher level of brain activity than just simply accepting what my friend says. Yes. And that brings us to a more direct question. And, uh, I, uh, I'm going to begin with you, Mark. In Canada, uh, we are a, in a society where there is religious liberty. Uh, just recently, south of the border, we've seen some things happening where the issue of religious liberty has come to the forefront. But what about here in Canada? Are we seeing any erosions of religious liberty or any dangers to the issue of freedom of expression and freedom of religion? It's an excellent question and I think that as uh, we look on uh, recent events we realize that uh, we're living in a changing society there's no question about that and the things which we particularly have practiced in the past as kind of a level playing field uh, have changed whether that has to do with uh, how we give people the right basically to speak about matters of ethics from a, a religious basis, uh, whether that is in a university setting, whether that happens to be in a high school setting or whatever. Uh, I think that there is pressure, frankly, upon people who hold religious beliefs to conform to a point of view which comes from a community which is not as guided, perhaps, by their perspective as are others. 
And those are issues that uh, are more frequently coming before the courts to uh, be able to make uh, a determination on where we as a nation stand. And that's an interesting time to be involved in a faith-based life. Yes. And uh, you, you use the word courts, and so we have two lawyers with us. Gentlemen, uh, do we, are we seeing anything in the courts right now that, and I'll begin with you, Jerry, that we are seeing uh, this danger uh, or this, uh, and maybe danger is even too strong of a word, but we're seeing some of the erosions of religious liberty here in Canada. Well, the one theme that uh, has come out in a few cases, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate, is the idea that the majority should be deciding whether the minority has a particular right. And that's been coming out in the university settings, both in public and private universities. There's a debate going on mm -hmm. about whether or not a certain beliefs and belief uh, structures should be accepted within society. And the, the general trend amongst some of the lower courts has been to accept the idea that the majority can make that call and can limit the expression of the minority. Uh, I find that disturbing and it's, it, it's going to lead to nothing but uh, a limitation on our rights if we don't step back from this debate and uh, ask ourselves whether or not uh, every kind of expression must be protected so that we can have this marketplace of ideas that uh, John Stuart Mill uh, talked about uh, when he wrote uh, over a hundred years ago. So the, the, I am concerned about our universities right now. Kevin, uh we have a, just a little under five minutes left. Uh, and so we're going to continue our discussion in the next show. But I want to, do we have any specific cases in which we are seeing some of these erosions take place that yeah. can form a basis for us to have some discussion now and continue that discussion in our next show? Yeah, yeah there, there are some cases before the courts. Um, uh, one uh, that, that was in June of 2017 starting about uh, physician uh, conscience and whether in, in light of physician assisted suicide whether they have the right to dissent. And a lot of what this comes from, I think the tension that we're seeing in the law uh, has to do with, unlike the United States which had a, a bill of rights based on individual freedoms, we also have an equality right in our charter. Um, and the equality right is intended to try and, and uh, uh, ensure that nobody's discriminated against based on religion or, or race or sexual orientation or any of the other enumerated or analogous grounds. Um, the, the difficulty with the equality right is it, it, it in its application. Um, where it's being pushed into the private sphere, being pushed into inst Christian and re other religious institutions, pushed into the home, pushed into individuals' professions in a way that has a conforming um, effect. Uh, and, and that tension, uh, in my mind, is one of the biggest ones that we're facing in the law in Canada right now, is that the use of the equality right to try and create conformity of thought um, and conformity of action, even when it is within a private sphere. Uh, and some of the cases that I think we're going to talk about in some of the next sessions, uh, you see that tension coming up. And, and, and it all comes back to this idea of carving out a space where we, as religious people or different religions or uh, atheists, can in fact have their, their private space within their homes and their institutions. So we talk about that carving out of space. And so in our last two minutes here, uh, Mark, I'm going to give you the opportunity to kind of close us off on this thought. This idea of carving out a space for people to not have to conform mm. to the majority, as Jerry was talking about just a moment ago. Can you give us some thoughts on the importance of carving out that space for people to not have to conform to the majority? Well, because faith, uh, a faith life is a very personal experience, right? Because it is not sort of a monolithic thing that would be the same for every one of us around this table. Um, the, the, the thing that becomes so very important is to be able to give people the opportunity to determine how they relate to what it means to live a life of faith. And that may mean uh, that it is involved in everything that they do from going shopping, uh, when they go shopping, where they go shopping, what they choose to purchase, to a, a much more laid back approach to that kind of thing. And it is the right of the individual in the sight of God to make that determination as to how that works. 
Well, I will tell you, this has been an exciting discussion. We have laid a foundation for our next shows where we're going to get into some details. We're going to help give people the opportunity to see that there are cases happening now that many times don't make the front page of the news, and we need to pay attention to them. We need to be praying, we need to be acting, and we'll talk about what all of that means for each of us as individuals. And so as we conclude our discussion here today, I'd like to have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon our discussion that we've just had. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the fact that your very foundation of your government is that of freedom, the freedom to choose. So as we've discussed this freedom to choose, I pray for every individual watching and listening that they would sense that we serve a God who chooses to allow us to have choice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, you know, in order for love to truly be love, it must give you the opportunity to say yes or to say no. That's the very foundation of God's government. Today, we've talked about that freedom of choice, the freedom of religion. And I'm so thankful for my three guests, Kevin, Mark, and Jerry, for joining me today. Thank you, gentlemen, mm -hmm. for helping in this discussion. Friend, if you want more resources to learn about this God of love who gives the freedom to choose, I want to encourage you to go to our website. It is written Canada.ca, or you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash IIW Canada. There you can watch the archives of this program. There you can learn about this God of love who gives a freedom to choose. Thank you so much for joining us. I invite you to join us again next week. Until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.